Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. It uh, really is a great pleasure to be here. I was, uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, Sir Keith Porter's um, house officer in Selleck Hospital, as it was then, uh, the venerable successor to the Accident Hospital in Birmingham. And uh, I think it's fair to say that Sir Keith uh, set me on my path to becoming a, a trauma surgeon. And, um, and that's currently my full-time job, um, employed by the Royal Navy, but working most of my time within the NHS. So before I get on to the uh, normal disclaimers, I'd just like to give a quick overview of what we'll be covering tonight. So um, first of all, we'll start off with explaining the slightly weird title uh, of my talk, and then we're going to cover um, wound ballistics. So look at some of the um, some of the science behind the physics of the interaction between projectiles and the human body. We're then going to look at um, how tissue behaves when it um, when it's struck by bullets, and then we're going to look at some of the treatment algorithms. And I apologise, it gets a little bit a little bit surgical, a bit orthopedic, but that's what you'd expect from me, I guess. Finally, we're going to allow a bit of time for discussion, and I'll talk about ways that you can find out more. And I'm going to uh, be a little bit self-indulgent and talk about some of the research that um, myself and some colleagues are doing down at Porton Down. So uh, let's get on with the um, usual disclaimers. Um, so as I said before, I'm a, a regular commission officer in the Royal Navy, but um, uh, in between deployments, I'm working at uh, Oxford in the major trauma centres there, and I'm the uh, actually just taken over as the uh, clinical lead of the Oxford Trauma Service, uh, which is interesting to get to see all the Datex forms about my colleagues, which I enjoy. Um, I'm also the consultant advisor in trauma and orthopaedics, um, so I help to uh, help to advise commanders for any issues that pertain to trauma, um, and also uh, help to. Um, uh, supervise um, and assist the next generation of surgeons, which is probably the most interesting part of my additional roles. Um, obviously, got to emphasize anyone who knows me uh, will realize that this really is uh, quite an important part of the talk. Uh, definitely, my own views. Um, I don't represent or speak for the Royal Navy, Her Majesty's Government, or the uh, Oxford University Hospitals Trust. Um, and in terms of conflict of interest, uh, I think it's a good time to say that I have one, and I would like you all to buy my book. Um, if you're interested in ballistic trauma, it's a, great, it's a great way to sort of learn a little bit more. And if you're just financially savvy, if you no note that the, uh, the used price is currently uh, about a third greater than the new price, this book represents an excellent return on your investment as well. So I'd urge you to do that, uh, do that as soon as we finish this, uh, this, this talk. So why the title? Um, a few people have got in touch with me and asked about my interest in Welsh hip hop. Um, you, people might not realise this, but this was a, uh, a title that I've uh, plagiarised from a um, an early noughties uh, Newport hip hop band. Uh, one of their tracks was Guns Don't Kill People, Rappers Do. Um, the reason I've chosen this talk is because I think when medics start talking about ballistics, we focus immediately on the wrong thing. There's far too much discussion about the firearms, the, the small arms that are involved. People, you hear things on the news about people being shot with a high velocity rifle. Um, and, I, and I think the focus is very wrong. Um, it, the guns obviously are important, but the, it's, it's the bullets and the bullet design and how bullets interact with the body, which is far more important to us as clinicians. The other reason I've chosen this title is because all the good ones were already chosen by the people in the past. Um, so I pulled out three fairly significant reviews from the literature. And if you look, there's a common theme amongst them, um, amongst the titles. So um, lies, damn lies or ballistics, my personal favorite. Um, wound ballistics, a review of common misconceptions and uh, applied wound ballistics, what's new and what's true. Um, the implication of the last title being there's an awful lot out there that's false. And this is certainly my experience. So as somebody who spent a lot of time researching in this area, you, you, you find a lot of stuff that's misleading, confused, um, and I think this is because of the influence of politics and money. So as an example, in the, um, in the 70s, there were a lot of research papers coming out of Sweden that were talking about the, um, the brutal and inhumane wounding patterns from M16 rounds. And this was to do with their government's opposition to the Vietnam War and the US military's new adoption of um, an M16 firing uh, 556 rounds. In actual fact, the, um, the wounds produced by 556 NATO bullet, the SS-109, are just broadly similar to military um, uh, military rifle rounds that have been um, used for some time. And in fact, if anything, they're a fair bit lighter. Um, the other influence is, um, is money, and particularly this is true in America. 
So um, the distortion of the, the gun lobby and sort of uh, non-scientists that are, who are influential in that field have, um, have unfortunately sort of distorted the way we talk about it and the way we study it. Um, so as a consequence, there is a lot of misconception out there. So hopefully at the end of this talk, we'll have, um, we'll have uh, got to a bit better place. Having stressed the importance of bullets over firearms, I think it's worth quickly just um, uh, just looking at some of the um, uh, some of the, the, the features of of a firearm. So um, this is a this is a rifle. So it's a long barreled weapon. Um, and just so we understand some of the the, the, the basics of what's going on, um, the bullet ends up um, being fed up through a magazine here, ends up in a breech which is just here. Which is sealed by the um, by the bolt where that slides forward. Um, that then creates essentially a, um, a a tube with only one opening at the uh, the business end. The bullet, when you pull the trigger, is ignited, or the propellant behind the bullet is ignited, and the bullet is then forced down as the propellant gas expands. The bullet is then forced down the barrel. It accelerates, and uh, when it leaves the end of the barrel here, that's the muzzle velocity, or the velocity it has is the muzzle velocity which is the fastest speed that it's going to be traveling at um, through the entire course of its, uh, its path. Um, the inside of the, um, the barrel has a uh, spiral groove and that confers a spin to the bullet, which um, confers stability. And that's, um, that's the only time we'll be talking about, um, uh, about firearms really in this, in this talk. So why is it relevant? Well, they're common. There's um, an estimation of uh, about a billion serviceable firearms around the um, around the world, and the thing that would surprise us for, for those of us dialing in from the UK, um, we live in a country where the state has a near total monopoly on firearm usage. Um, obviously, it licenses um, uh, under strict conditions certain private owners to own firearms, like the one I've just showed you. Um, but we, we would we would assume that the majority of firearms around the world are held by uh, police and militaries. In actual fact, that's not true. Globally, only about 15% of them are. So there is a lot of sort of fairly loosely controlled firearms around the world. So, and the United Kingdom is, a, is, is, is not really representative of the, the worldwide situation. Um, I don't think anyone would be shocked to learn that in terms of private ownership, the United States is way, way ahead of most other countries. But you can see going down the list, actually, there's a lot of countries where private uh, firearm ownership is entirely normal and it's not a weird thing at all. And unfortunately, this is the truth of why this is relevant to all of us. So outside of the, um, the low level criminality that's occurring in a lot of, uh, increasingly in a lot of sort of urban centers in the UK, what we are preparing as, a, as, as clinicians that work across the country is to uh, respond and to be resilient against the marauding terrorist firearms attacks. Um, fortunately, still quite rare in the UK, but obviously, um, Oslo, France, Mumbai, um, and, and sadly, even just yesterday in uh, Boulder in Colorado, these events happen entirely, um, entirely predictably and entirely uh, regularly, unfortunately. And as uh, those of us who work in the, um, um, in the emergency trauma pre-hospital and hospital environments, this is something we need to make sure our systems are able to cope with. So not just firearms casualties, but potentially large simultaneously numbers of firearms casualties. Um, obviously, I'm in the military, so uh, we'll talk a, a, a very little bit about military firearms. And this often surprises people that military, um, in, in, in a conflict situation, firearms are actually a relatively small course of, um, uh, of casualties. Um, it's normally about three to one uh, of, of explosive weapons to firearm weapons in terms of casualty generation. And that's remarkably consistent amongst the... Um, the graph here shows the uh, 10 years of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, but that's remarkably consistent with Vietnam um, and World War II um, and, and, and even World War I, where it was, if anything, it was skewed even greater in favor of um, explosive weapon causing, causing injuries. So let's get on to some of the science. Um, before we get into the, uh, the, the Newtonian physics of this, um, it's worth stating that wound ballistics are entirely unpredictable. If we think about the ballistics that occur inside a firearm, these are known as internal ballistics, where there is an explosion of a set amount of uh, propellant. That propellant confers a certain amount of energy into a bullet, and the bullet travels down the gun. When it leaves the gun, it becomes uh, the study of uh, external ballistics. 
And that, again, is incredibly reproducible. If you think about the accuracy of modern firearms with sort of sub uh, one MOA um, accuracy that would allow a, marks, um, a sniper or marksman to um, reproducibly hit a very small target at ranges, you know, 800 meters plus. These are very precise machines, very precise tools. And, uh, and the ballistics, the science behind it is very predictable. As soon as that bullet contacts tissue, everything, um, everything gets a little bit weird. So the first thing I'd like to say is, although I'm gonna be offering some rules of thumb in this talk, wound ballistics are incredibly unpredictable. Um, one of the difficulties that I'll talk about at the end is, is actually, they're so unpredictable that trying to make a reproducible standardized model, even under laboratory conditions, is extremely difficult. Um, and that's basically why I've lost all my hair. Um, so the first rule I'd use is that you've got to think about this in terms of energy. So remembering, going back to our sort of school, uh, school physics, kinetic energy in the context of, of ballistics is the ability to damage tissue. That's what you've got to think about. Kinetic energy is the potential to damage tissue. The key concept to understand here is the rate that that kinetic energy is transferred into the tissue is related to drag. Um, and it's the this rapidity that our tissue slow down projectiles, slow down bullets, relates very closely to the severity of the wounds that are produced. So a quick, uh, a quick rehearser. Um, kinetic energy is proportional, or sorry, in this sense, equal to mass times the square velocity, velocity halved. So um, the key take home to that is velocity is um, far more significant than mass in terms of the amount of energy that a bullet possesses. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So if you've got kinetic energy, that's a big bold KE um, before you, um, that uh, is possessed by a bullet before it strikes a limb. And um, this is probably now a good point to give a trigger warning. This is the first of a series of x-rays and clinical photographs that are all used with the permission of the patient, but um, certainly are graphic. And if this isn't your cup of tea, first of all, you're probably in the wrong webinar. And uh, secondly, I apologize if that did cause any distress, but um, the kinetic energy on the left of the screen um, is, is what's possessed by the projectile before it strikes the limb. It strikes the limb and then it um, carries on through. You can see from the, um, from the, uh, the x-rays that there's no, um, there's no retained bullet or fragments. And that's because the bullets transited all the way through the limb. So it still has kinetic energy. It's still moving as it hits the other side. The delta or the difference between the two kinetic energies is what's been transferred into the tissue. And that's what creates this tissue damage that we're gonna see. So that is a conceptually broadly how the, um, how kinetic energy rates to, relates to, um, to wounding, but it gets a lot more complicated than that because it's all about drag. It's all about the uh, rapidity that the, um, the, the bullet is slowed down and the amount of energy it, dis it uh, deposits into the wound. So there is um, a, Beautifully elegant equation looking at that. Um, but the, uh, there's not gonna be a test at the end, you'll be pleased to know. The key things to pull out of this equation though is the drag force and the retarding effect on the bullet is uh, proportional to the, um, uh, both the density of the fluid in inverted commas. So the fluid in this case, in the arm here, was the ulnar bone. So the, the round contacted the ulnar bone and that's an incredibly dense fluid, it's not a fluid I know, it's incredibly dense tissue, and that had a massive retardant effect on the bullet and essentially stopped it. The other thing that's proportional to is the, um, is the surface area of the front of the bullet. So I've got a, um, a, a half inch round here, and it's a Spitzer design, so it's got a, um, I'll put it up so you can see the contrast, it's got a, a, a nice sharp point, and it's got a little boat tail on the back, so it's a very aerodynamic stable design. Um, that will that has a lot less resistance when it's traveling in this direction and forward than if it starts tumbling and it presents its side, uh, side on to the um, direction of travel. So when a bullet tumbles like this, it, there's a huge amount more drag and, and consequently there's a, there's a much quicker, um, it slows down much quicker if that's not an oxymoron and the amount of energy that it deposits into the tissues is much greater for a given time. And that creates a, translates into a much more severe wound. So um, I'd like to delve into some of the history now because it's uh, quite a useful illustration at this point. And uh, I'm also, I'm a bit of a nerd as well. So I do love the history of it. So back in the late um, uh, 19th century, um, the British military had just adopted a new weapon. 
And as part of the, uh, the new uh, Lee Metford weapon system, they probably didn't call them weapon systems back then, but as part of the new weapon system was a shift from um, uh, black powder or gunpowder, which created a lot of smoke, to smokeless powders. Now, the, um, the reason to do this was to get rid of the smoke. If you had a large um, body of soldiers um, all lined up together, firing their weapons, after three or four rob volleys, the, uh, there was so much smoke around, they couldn't actually see anything to aim at, and also their own position became very obvious. So it became a, um, a military requirement to go switch over to smokeless powders. And that was when these sort of nitrocellulose and uh, cordite family of uh, propellants came along and became available. Now, not only were these burning without smoke, but they also were much, much, much more powerful. So the military transition from lead rounds, um, the advantage of which is they're very dense and so they're very heavy and they have a lot of momentum, to um, what they call jacketed rounds or full metal jacketed rounds. The reason they did this was when soft lead rounds were used with the new, much more powerful propellant, as they were accelerated down the length of the barrel um, a lot, uh, with a lot greater energy, they would shed their skins. So I think of lead pencils. So the outer surface of the lead would foul the barrel and, um, and the barrels would have to be cleaned out between a few rounds. And that was causing stoppages and it was causing potentially breach explosions as well. So to solve that problem, they jacketed the rounds with a copper material. Um, so the, you had the, the core was made of a heavy, dense lead. So you got the mass, but then the, um, the copper um, uh, the copper coating meant that the bullets slipped down the barrel nice and quickly, and um, you got the extra velocity as well. So if you think of the kinetic energy equation, you had the mass of the lead, you had the velocity of the new propellant plus the copper jacketing. And this is what we, we mean when we talk about fully metal jacketed rounds. And on the, uh, on the screen here, we can see our original rounds. But as so often with technology, there's an unforeseen, um, unforeseen consequence. And... Um, this is, from, uh, this is from a BMJ article in uh, 1896. And I've got to be honest, if the BMJ still had a military and naval uh, section, I might renew my subscription. But it is quite an extraordinary um, uh, article because it's talking about the difficulties with the new type of bullet. And again, if BMJ articles were this interesting, they wouldn't stay in their cellophane. But if we look at some of it, so we were talking about that the new rounds were part traversing the soft parts of the body without smashing them, even piercing through bones without splitting them. It's reported that one tribesman who had been hit by six bullets was treated in hospital and made a good recovery. I love the way the BMJ is reporting this as it was, it was an undesirable um, outcome. In consequence, the military authorities tended to turn their attention to the task of making a Lee Metford bullet, which, without losing its ranging power, still inflicted a wound sufficient to, sufficiently severe to stop a rush. What they meant was a, a charge of, um, a charge of uh, uh, people at British forces. Um, oh, sorry. The, uh, the correspondent of the Times states that such a bullet has been devised by Captain Bertie Clay, superintendent of the Dum Dum Ammunition Factory. So Dum Dum is a small town in India, and there was a large British military um, ammunition factory there. And Dum Dum is where the expression Dum Dum bullets comes from, because um, Captain Bertie Clay had the brilliant idea that you only need the copper jacketing of the round um, in the part of the bullet that contacts the inside of the barrel. So that's the bit where you, you don't want the lead um, fouling the barrel. But actually, if you think about the lead at the front of the barrel, uh, sorry, the front of the bullet, if you keep the copper um, copper jacket off that, what happens is you still get the um, you still get the effect of the lead hitting the tissues and deforming. So I've got a um, this is a, a soft nose round here, um, and as you see, the tip of it is exposed lead, and the side is copper there, and when that strikes a deer, for example, um, it distorts and what we call expands and dumps its energy. So instead of it having a, a, nice, a nice sharp tip like this round here, it will deform and slow down very quickly as it passes through the tissues and then transfer most of the energy or transfer its energy very rapidly into the tissues. And uh, so these became known as soft nose rounds or, or because of the fact that they were first developed, dum-dum bullets. And uh, an example of a couple of 
couple of types here. You can get a similar effect by having a hollow nose point on the tip of the bullet as well. And you, you can see a, a clearer diagram there of how that peels back when it strikes tissue. And I've got a clinical photograph of, um, uh, this was a police uh, nine millimeter round that struck that ulna. Um, and police uh, around the world are, are police officers as well. Um, the live rounds they carry are, um, they practice with fully metal jacketed rounds but the rounds that they carry on operations are, um, are soft nose deforming rounds. So if you see someone um, in your practice that's been shot by a police officer, um, first of all, it's likely that they need the other kind of uh, specialist doctor, um, the one that works in the basement. Uh, but secondly, um, they're likely to be in, have been injured by these particularly, um, particularly damaging bullets that are soft nose and transfer a lot of energy. So the wounds are, expected to be more severe than perhaps you were anticipating. Um, these expanding rounds were outlawed um, in the first of the Hague Conventions um, by, um, uh, by European powers together with America um, in the first Hague Convention. They're outlined for military use only um, and it's perfectly legal for hunters to use them um, and it's perfectly legal for police forces to use them. So let's have a look at some of the wound interactions. So with all the caveats I mentioned before of the difficulties in predicting the, um, the behavior of, of, of bullets when they contact tissue, we can, we, we can with some generality, divide uh, the components of a wound into three main types of which two are relevant. Um, and the last one's a bit of a included for completeness is quite controversial. So the first bit's the permanent cavity or the wound tract. So this is conceptually the, um, the the, as the projectile passes through the body, it crushes and lacerates and tears the tissue. And essentially what it does is behaves a bit like an arrow, if you like. So if you had a nine millimeter arrow passing through you, you'd expect to end up with a nine millimeter hole in your body. And that's the similar to the permanent cavity or the wound tract of the, of the, of the bullet. That's um, it's roughly gonna be the same size as the bullet. And um, in theory, if you have an, a, um, um, an um, entry wound and an exit wound, um, in, in a limb, you can look at the, um, the direct line between the two and one would anticipate, again, this is not consistent and these rounds aren't predictable, but one would expect that there'd be a line of tissue damage between those, uh, those two wounds. Um, it gets a bit more complicated when we start talking about ter temporary cavities and the effect that's sometimes described a little bit inaccurately as cavitation. So a temporary cavity is a bit more complicated. When there's when there's very rapid uh, transfer of kinetic energy into the tissues, the um, kinetic energy rate, uh, the kinetic energy causes an acceleration of tissue away from radially away from the path of the um, uh, path of the bullet, and that interestingly causes stretch and damage to the tissues. And I'll show you some uh, photos of that in a, in a moment, um, but that also generates a subatmospheric pressure because the tissues are pushed away. There's essentially a vacuum um, in, the, in, in the path of the bullet and that can cause small amounts of debris to be dragged into the wound, which can increase the contamination. Um, cavitation is a pretty odd phenomena. Um, part of the large areas of misconception arise because cavitation is one of the more eye-catching and impressive phenomena associated with ballistics. So with high-speed cinematography, um, there was an awful lot of uh, very cool, very impressive looking slow motion uh, footage um, of bullets traversing ballistic gelatin, soap blocks, that sort of thing, even underwater. And you create these very impressive looking um, uh, bubble and cavity effects. And people were mentally looking at these gelatin blocks and transferring those images into a wound and imagining that's the amount of damage that was done. And so they got um, there's a significant danger of overestimating the severity of wounds if you, um, if, if you think too much about those, uh, those techniques. If you look at the depth a normal bullet has to travel before it becomes unstable and starts tumbling and starts creating a, um, a, very, a very large cavity, that's normally um, far wider than the average, average person's uh, limb or body. The final thing is shockwave. Now, this is very controversial. Um, the American uh, firearms uh, industry talks an awful lot about this, this idea of stopping power and this idea that you can shoot someone and although you don't hit any major organs, they drop because of some kind of 
semi-mystical um, shockwave. There is a shockwave, it generates quite low energies and it can, there have been a couple of animal studies that have measured an effect on the central nervous system. But I think in a lot of literature, it is, um, it is overstated. Uh, this is a quite a nice little picture that demonstrates the, um, um, you've got a handgun being fired. You can see the shadow of the bullet. Uh, it's a black and white high-speed photography. And you can look at the ripples um, in the polarized light demonstrating the shockwave is in front of the path of the bullet. So um, a shockwave is, a, is, is analogous to a supersonic sound wave. So a sound wave traveling faster than the um, speed of sound. Most, um, unless you're buying, specifically buying subsonic um, rounds, most, uh, most ammunition is supersonic. Um, so my rifle's got a modifier, a, a, a suppressor on it, a moderator, um, but it still makes a loud noise because the bullet is supersonic. So there's a, a, there's a sonic boom from the bullet. Um, sonic booms are, um, are literally a, a shockwave being formed. Um, and so um, uh, that shockwave precedes the path of the bullet. And this occurs um, schematically in the, um, uh, represented by the black lines uh, moving in front of the bullet um, on the diagram on the top left of the screen. It's very low energy um, compared to the bullet itself. It does very little tissue damage. But as I said, in theory, the central nervous system can be affected by this. But in clinical practice, I would ignore this. Okay, so uh, another one of my slightly late trigger warnings. Um, the other thing to start thinking about is it's tissues are not homogeneous and, and tissues behave differently to stretch. So tissues like skeletal muscle and um, lung tissue, for example, tolerate stretch very well. They're stretched all the time in their normal function. Other tissues don't to tolerate stretch at all. So um, in the bottom left, we've got some, um, so that's skin demonstrating, you can see the cracks where the, it's, um, it's been torn, but actually overall tissues elastic and tolerate stretch well. Um, lung, you've got a, um, a bone strike of a, uh, of a round hitting a rib and it's fragmented, um, but the lung tissue itself, although you can see it's, um, uh, it, it, it looks like slightly edematous. It doesn't look very happy. It's contused, but it's clearly tolerated. There hasn't been a massive tearing and disruption of the lung parenchyma. Um, muscle tissue as well. This is another frag fragmented round. It went from them, this patient's right lateral thigh out of the right medial thigh and entering the left medial thigh. Um, but again, the tissue itself is looking actually pretty healthy um and uh, because it tolerates uh, sorry skeletal muscles looking pretty healthy because it tolerates stretch very well um i think you can see from that clinical photo things could have been a lot lot worse if they're a little bit higher um going into this fairly gruesome picture i'm not a hepatologist but i can conclude from looking at this picture that um liver tissue does not tolerate stretch very well so this is a completely destroyed uh, liver um because liver just tears So let's look at things that can make, um, that can likely make. Um, so looking in, the, um, in a, in a lab-based theoretical concept first, let's think about what's, what things would be likely to be aggravate wounds. And it's all about the drag equation on the top right of the screen there. So what's likely to increase drag and increase energy transfer into the tissues? So instability. So if a round's unstable, if we look at the top left, if this round here is tumbling, and so as it passes sideways, as it tumbles over on itself, it presents a very large surface area. And so the energy is gonna be imparted at a much faster rate, and that's gonna cause tissue stretch. And tissue instability, and this is when I give a shout out to uh, Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Tom Stevenson. Um, who's done a lot of good work at uh, Cranfield University um, looking at um, the effect of uh, what happens when bullets pass through clothing before they go on to uh, strike tissue and the effect of increasing um, uh, wound severity when a bullet does pass through, um, uh, through clothing, um, essentially because it causes it to destabilize and so you get a lot more of this tumbling effect and a lot more energy imparting into the, into the tissues. And I'm um, pleased to say not only has he published that around the world, um, but he's also got a PhD for that. So nice one, Tom. Um, the getting into the sort of the pathophysiology now, so the biological response to this, it's worth thinking about um, 
uh, how the tissues are going to be responding. So the first thing to say is the amount of energy or the potential energy, kinetic energy available in, 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 in gunshot wounds is enormous. So if we think of falls and um, falls and uh, motor vehicle collisions as being on a spectrum. So ground level falls are on one end of that sort of low energy spectrum. As we're getting onto road traffic collisions, we can get a lot higher and that sort of starts to approach in the sort of um, energies that are involved in, um, in, 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 in gunshot wounds. So they do tend to involve greater amounts of tissue disruption and destruction than we're used to seeing in our normal conventional practice. Um, and I'm talking predominantly here about higher energy um, weapons that you'd see on a battlefield, so more rifle rounds. Um, so again, more sort of, uh, as a comparison here, so more in my uh, right hand, had to think about that, a rifle bullet, much bigger, heavier, and fired with greater velocity than a handgun bullet here. So one would expect a, a far greater amount of energy transfer from, um, from, from rifle rounds. So what are the injuries we see? Well, the, the primary injury is um, the, the immediate tissue destruction that happens within um, either instantaneously or within the first few minutes, which is the shearing, tearing, laceration, and that results in, in tissue necrosis. Um, there's tissue that's been traumatized, often that has been stretched, um, that will undergo a, a slightly more programmed apoptotic cellular death process. And that tends to occur in the first 48 hours or so. And that's a bit more organized, but that is also predictable. And that will happen in a, in a ballistic wound. Then we've got tertiary injury. And we could talk about this as being the, the stuff that we as clinicians are supposed to prevent. So um, if we keep the patient in a shocked and hypobulimic state, they're going to be hypoperfusing their damaged tissues, and that can cause more destruction. If we um, allow them to develop a com compartment syndrome and the pressure in, um, in their muscular compartments increases, that can um, cause, uh, again, late, late tissue death. Um, and uh, similarly, if we allow um, unclean wounds to um, become septic, you can get um, unnecessary late destruction from, um, uh, from, from uh, an infective causes. I think what I'm trying to say here is gunshot wounds behave differently from um, uh, conventional, um, even the conventional high energy um, fractures. So if I see a, um, a pilon, a nasty pilon, um, on day zero that it presents, we're going to take them to the theatre, uh, we're going to wash it out. Um, we're going to put an external fixator on it and uh, we're going to put a wound back on it. And um, the next day we're going to take them back to theatre and together with our um, plastic surgical colleagues, we're going to unwrap the wound and the wound will more than likely, if we've done our jobs right, be clean. And that will allow us to put the plates and screws in to fix it, move the three muscle, uh, three muscle uh, flaps, the racillus flaps or the ALTs to cover the wound and then we can do the definitive procedure. You cannot do that with a gunshot wound. It will still be evolving. The tissues will still be responding. You can do a very good job of uh, wound excision on day one, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, on day zero, sorry, but the wound will continue to evolve. It's not that you haven't done a good job, it's that tissue that looked healthy and viable on day zero won't look healthy and viable on day one or two. So wounds will evolve and you've got to keep treat them with respect. Which brings us on to um, our management um, protocols. And again, I apologize, this is a little bit more uh, surgical orientated, a little bit more hospital-based orientated, but you shouldn't give a, um, you shouldn't give a presenter link to a, uh, a surgeon because they're just going to hold the mic, I'm afraid. So we divide this up into decision, incision, excision. And I'll talk about a few, uh, a few pearls, a few ticks and trips at the end. Um, so decision is uh, assessing the amount of energy being transferred into the wound. And we'll talk a bit about how you can do that with fairly basic, um, basic technologies and approaches. Um, incision. So I separate, some people talk about debridement. I think that gets a bit ambiguous. Um, I don't like it when people pronounce it in the French way as well. That's a bit pretentious. I'm saying that someone who works in Oxford and drinks lattes. Um, but I think it's more useful to divide debridement into incision, which essentially is extending a wound, um, making a surgical incision, um, opening skin, opening fascia. And that allows you to do two things. That decompresses a muscular compartment and allows you to explore and then proceed with the next steps of the operation. As distinct from excision, which is removable of non-viable tissue and, and, and gross contamination. 
So together, those essentially are the, the two components of debridement. Um, but I think it's worth dividing the two up because they serve two different purposes. So let's talk about decision making. And you've got another QR code here, um, a rather naughty apologies injury, uh, but I made this an open access paper um, somewhere. Um, so if you want to download this, this talks a lot about our experience um, from the last two conflicts of, of managing gunshot wounds. And it did allow us to develop some rules of thumb. Again, I'm contradicting myself. I said there are no rules, but there are some guidelines that you can sort of follow to assess these wounds. So first of all, any high energy transfer wound or those with neurovascular injury need to be surgically explored. So if you've got an obvious complex large wound with a lot of obvious tissue damage, in other words, a big hole, that needs to be surgically explored. A lot of tissue has been, um, uh, a lot of uh, tissue has been destroyed and you need to know what's going on. You need to actually perform an excision. If there's neurovascular injury, in other words, distal to the wound, if there's a neurovascular deficit, then clearly that needs to be explored. Um, and, and these are right off the bat, these, these guys, these, these injuries need to go to theatre. So having said that, if you've got a wound which doesn't involve a large amount of obvious destruction and it's neurovascular intact, you can start to um, think about what are possible features of high energy transfer. So the first one is, is fracture, and that's predictable from our sort of blackboard theoretical discussion. If a bullet strikes a bone, it's like to impart that um, energy quite quickly. Um, and so it's like to be a more severe high energy uh, wound. Secondly, if there's been retention of the bullet or indeed fragmentation of the bullet, um, all of the kinetic energy held by that bullet has been dumped into the tissue if the bullet's retained whole. If a bullet's fragmented, the concern is that each of those components of the bullet, and it's normally the, the jacket, the, um, the outer lining of the bullet that is, is retained in the tissue, all of those individual pieces of fragments will have um, essentially become secondary projectiles and they, will have, um, and they will have caused their own permanent tract and permanent cavity. So one would anticipate a more complex, severe amount of tissue damage deep in the wound. And that's also true of fracture, actually. The, um, when a bone fractures or shatters, as it often does when it's struck by a bullet, you create um, multiple small amounts of uh, bone splinters that themselves behave as, as secondary missiles. So again, looking back to uh, this unfortunate or fortunate, depending on your perspective, um, casualty, you can see the large amounts of the bullet fragment. I'm very confident to know, um, I had a paper reviewed by someone that very snootily said that this was a blast injury, um, but we happen to know how this guy was injured because his mate standing next to him that accidentally shot him uh, was charged uh, with the negligent discharge of his um, 5.56 uh, FN Minimi um, uh, machine gun. So um, we, we're very confident this is a, a gunshot injury. Um, but you can see on the CT scanogram on the, on the left of the screen how the bullets fragmented and uh, been deposited throughout his, um, his thighs. Um, and that's how we know it was a high energy transfer wound. You can see the very ragged wounds, which also indicate that a lot of tissue dot loss. But as we said before, the muscle itself has coped with that stretching pretty well, looks pretty healthy. Um, so that wound is after debridement and evacuation back. That's not what a gunshot wound looks like at first presentation, obviously. So again, going back to this, um, the, this tibia X-fix that's been, um, uh, sorry, tibia gunshot wound and uh, open fracture that's been stabilized as an external fixator. Um, you can see large amounts of multifragmentary damage to the bone itself. And this is going to be a 25 year old, um, almost certainly male, um, quite probably Fijian uh, leg. This guy's cortices are going to be rock solid. So the amount of energy to shatter them is enormous. And that energy would have been dumped into the limb. There's no sign of a bullet or fragment. So we imagine there's been a near, um, there's been some kinetic energy retained by the, um, by the round itself, but an awful lot of that has been transferred. Okay, so the experience of the Americans with handguns and lower energy transfer wounds is that not all gunshot wounds need surgery. And um, with low energy transfer wounds, you do not need to take these all to theater. Um, you can treat them with antibiotics. You don't close them primarily. Um, always splint the limb. That's important to kind of allow the tissues to recover and drain freely. Um, but um, not all of them need surgical treatment. And that can be very important if you're in a mass casualty situation and your hospital resources are being stretched. If you triage these patients, assess their wounds properly, um, 
you could potentially uh, avoid taking unnecessary theatre cases and using up your valuable theatre resources. So this heel wound that we saw before is a calcaneal fracture, but it's very neat. The other side looked a bit like that as well. It's impossible to say which was entry, which was exit. X-ray showed a nice neat little hole through the, um, through the uh, uh, calcaneum and there was no surgical treatment retire, required and that's healed up nicely. So we're gonna get on to a, a slightly controversial area as we wrap up, um, uh, we get towards the end of the talk. Um, the textbooks on the top left have all, um, all argued for quite an aggressive approach to laying open all gunshot wound tracks. Um, and the, um, uh, and this has been quite aggressively taught, uh, certainly to me in uh, military uh, surgical courses. But um, interestingly, if we look at the most experienced group of surgeons for dealing with gunshot wounds, and particularly high energy gunshot wounds, they were the senior surgeons of the Second World War. And, um, and the reason why they were so experienced is they spent the years of the First World War as junior surgeons learning their trade. And this was pre-antibiotic years as well. So these people were very good at treating and preventing infection with, with surgical treatment, with incision and excision. And one of the most experienced was uh, Olga V, um, who was a fairly angry general um, who uh, had experience of both world wars and wars in the Balkans as well. Um, and as you can see, he was quite adamant that unnecessary operations on through and through wounds affecting the soft parts are completely unnecessary and can potentially, his concern was the surgeon can do more damage than the bullet. Um, he emphasizes that too much skin um, is being removed. Skin is the most, uh, is the, if, of all structures, is the most viable, the most resistant to infection, and the most irreplaceable, as my plastic surgical colleagues would agree. Um, it can split it to give access, but never excise, except just in the wound, at the edges of the wounds. Um, circumcision of entry and exit wounds is the hallmark of a novice. You can just imagine this guy shouting at his junior surgeons. And again, the point three, which is almost the same as point one, wide excision of muscle, especially transverse section of muscle groups to expose a tract. I have been told to do this, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, so in the Second World War and First World War surgeons were very anti. So is there any science to back this up? Well, these are two experimental papers, both of which came, um, so the animal-based studies um, but they came from two groups of surgeons that had both been in previous military conflicts. On the left, we've got Martin Fackler, arguably the, um, the granddaddy of uh, ballistics research at the, um, uh, in, the, in the modern era. And he'd been in Vietnam as a naval surgeon, transferred over to the army and started doing research for them. And, um, and he proved with modern assault rifle wounds they, uh, uh, that he somehow caused to dogs. Um, they healed up fine without surgical treatment. And ditto a, um, a paper on sheep by a couple of British surgeons that both served in Korea came to a very similar conclusion that simple, straightforward, uncomplex wounds did not require aggressive uh, radical surgery. So I'm going to skip ahead now, and I think we're getting close to time. So forgive me. I'm going to leave some of the um, um, leave some of the more surgical uh, minutia. And um, I will we'll get on to, I do love an x-ray, that's the same way I'm gonna skip past these. Um, I'll talk about the options for, um, if you were interested in learning more about the subject, um, if you want something that's more clinically orientated, this is another um, blatant plug, but please feel free to um, buy the book. I don't get any money from it. I think we donated all the royalties to, uh, I think it was Blesma, um, but that's very clinically orientated. If you want a much more of a deep dive into the science of wound ballistics, um, the Coupland Rothschild and uh, Newball book, um, which is, I think it's 2004 from Springer, called Wound Ballistics, Basics and Application, that I've got on the screen. That's a really good, uh, it's pretty science heavy, but it's the definitive text, if you like, if you want to know more about this subject. Um, there is ongoing research. Um, this is my bigger of my two rifles. Um, this is the one that's bolted to the floor in Port and Down. Um, and we use this for some of the ongoing work. And although I promised earlier there'd be no slow motion footage, is uh, something that everyone really wanted to see. That is a, a ball bearing being accelerated into a sheep tibia. And the reason I love it, because it shows how hard it is to get it right, we, um, you can see the little plastic sabo 
um, crashing into the into the wound afterwards. So completely uh, voided the experiment. Uh, it's a good job we're getting a good deal on sheep uh, sheep legs. Um, and I think that is a good point for me to open a beer and us to um, open this up to any questions or discussion. So thank you very much for being so uh, patient and uh, and listening. <laughs>